Welcome to the Developer Tribe, where we delve into the process and practice of coaches, educators, and beyond. We're here at episode three of season three, and my thanks to those who have already reached out about the previous two. I'm blessed to have such brilliant guests come on and share with us, and today is no different. Don't forget you can now join our online space at thedevelopertribe.mn.co where we've brought together 12 experts in the fields related to coaching and education to support you in creating your coaching reality. Some exciting stuff on the way and if you're not already there, we hope to welcome you into the tribe soon. As ever, my thanks for your support, for listening and for being here however you got here. And with that, let's jump in. My guest today is a former footballer with Manchester United and Wigan Athletic, playing internationally for Northern Ireland. Following this, he entered coaching and management, qualified as a registered physiotherapist, and currently works in the area of mental health with Train to Be Smart. It's this rewarding work that I wanted to speak with my guest today. We welcome to the pod, Pat McGiven. How are we doing? Yeah, good, Tim. Yeah, really good. Looking forward to this. Yeah, absolutely. Myself too. And and it's just great to have you here. Um, I, I'm conscious that, you know, this isn't the focus of today's pod, but just round us up for us your experiences in football and how you came to following a, a really successful career, getting involved in working in mental health and founding Train to Be Smart. Yeah, OK. So just, just to give a very brief background, I've always, you know, from a very young age, I've had a, a real passion for sport and um, played from, I suppose, from the former of years of primary school, you know, played Gaelic sport, played soccer, played the basketball, did cross-country running, whatever was going, I always played them. And then eventually went in the Irish League Youth Football with, with Portadown Football Club, um, was there for a couple of years, was actually considered a little, you know, too small, really, to get in the youth teams until I took a growth spurt between 17 and 18. And... I suppose that's where things started to take off. In the final year at, at Port of Dine, then Manchester United um, sent a scout over Eddie Coulter, God rest him. And um, Eddie basically brought me over a trial at Manchester United in 1992. Um, played a trial game against Aston Villa. And after the trial game, was asked back for another three weeks in that summer in 1992. So when, after those three weeks, was offered a three-year deal and had five, you know, fantastic years, meeting some absolutely amazing characters during that time between 1997. Um, I was at a crossroads of my career between uh, around 96, 97. I had, was on the fringes of the first team, but went out on loan and got badly injured while I was on loan at, um, at Swansea. Managed only one game before I badly damaged my knee and then when I recovered from it, went out on loan to, to Wigan Athletic. After the, the loan spell at Wigan, we managed to um, win the league in 1997. I was at a crossroads where United offered me two years, Tim, but um, you know there were some fantastic players there, and I had really enjoyed, my, I suppose, my first team experience at Wigan Athletic, and they had offered me a three-year deal, and at that stage, I made a, a decision after having spoken to, to the gaffer, Alex Ferguson, that, that I was going and get first team football. So again, another five years at Wigan Athletic, played short, a short spell at Tranmere um, and then came back home, played within the Irish League and won the, the league with Glentoran before finally, uh, I suppose, uh, putting the boots up and went into the coaching. Um, whilst I was still playing at Wigan, I, I did my physio degree. So I had a, a, you know, I was quite proactive that way. My dad always had a, always was, would have said, you know, a little bit of education will, will follow you and carry you. And I think that's a great mantra. So um, when I then finished at Wigan, I had that, you know, I, I suppose I had that to, to fall back on when I went into part-time football again in the Irish League. But it just was a little bit too clinical for me, I suppose. And, um, I was used to a changing room environment that was used to, you know, the banter of a changing room and, and all the different social characters. So eventually went into the mental health and wellbeing coaching, um, went and did uh, a diploma within it. And that's really where I'm, I'm carrying the work 
through and, and train to be smart the charity which I founded um, in 2013. We do a lot of work surrounding the whole of smart the talk message. Um, I suppose my passion for you know I suppose my passion for for sport carries through from what I've said, but also and, and I suppose and I speak about this quite often, you know. In, in my first year at Manchester United, uh, my brother tragically took his own life through suicide. So that was a very emotive time. It was something that, you know, the, the club at Manchester United, even even though they probably didn't know it, the teammates and everything carried me through it. Um, because, you know, mental health related issues at that stage were not something that were spoken about as much. Um, but in a, in a roundabout way, it is, I suppose it has ignited the, the passion to do something positive out of what was a, a really tragic situation. So that's where I am, you know, in the area, coaching within the area of mental health to both young people and also, you know, the, the, the community generally, I suppose. Yeah, thank you for trying to trying to get that in all into to one uh, one capsule. You you've obviously done so much already, and and look, let me pass on my my condolences. And you know, I understand it's happened some time ago, and as you well know, you know, I've had similar experiences. Um, do do you feel like that obviously tragic event is? something that really spurred you towards what you're doing, whether you were conscious of that or not? To be honest, I, I don't think I was particularly conscious of it. You know, I think it was the subconscious more than anything else. I think, you know, having worked into, I suppose, to say, I sort of veered into this this area now. Um, I I always remember when I, when I came back from England and I was, I was sort of playing part-time and, um, I'd started the, the physio and as I was working as uh, you know within my own practice setting up my own practice within that. I remember within about two or three months, I, I turned around to my dad and I said, "Look, I don't think this is for me. I just think it's a little too clinical." So even then, there were questions I suppose being asked within that. And uh, as for the area of mental health, what and and I suppose it, it it's a great thing in that. Yes, education's brilliant, but actually having the clinical background and then having the mental health background and, and being able to link that, link the physical health to the mental and emotional health, him in a way is actually, a, 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 I suppose, a godsend because, you know, it's okay. Sometimes we, we talk about physical health and, and mental and emotional health, but we don't really link it. And, and there's such a link. That whenever you're able to marry the two, but it just took a while before you know it got to that stage. And and actually, it, I I would speak quite a bit to to young people. And and once you get that light bulb moment, I think that's where you get your purpose, I suppose. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. And um, uh, I'm going to try hard not to get on my my soapbox here because as as we've had a conversation before, you, you know that this is an area that. Um, is very important to, to me as well and that that link between physical health and uh, emotional and mental health within sport I, I think in the last let's say five ten years we, we've really shifted away from just seeing it as a byproduct you know having having recognized that there is a link that that link isn't just simply by well if I engage in physical activity within a community that I'm automatically going to be more emotionally or more mentally healthy, that there's, there's more to this that we can do as uh, practitioners, as facilitators, as coaches. So yeah, talk to us about the really positive work that you do with train to be smart and, and, and how you've married those two. Yeah, I think, you know, whether it's in primary school, secondary schools or, or even further up, I think, you know, having worked in the area of mental health, we realised that that it used to be thought that you know from the age of eighteen that that basically you, you, your brain was set. You know that it was a black and white state of thinking, and that you know you, that you couldn't change that. But you know, over the last number of years, it has been shown that with neuroplasticity of the brain, it, it, it doesn't matter what stage you want to. If you want to learn new things, if you want to, if you're prepared to do that then that's really good in terms of engagement. And I think with 
the, the young people in particular, and, and we, have, we have kids as, as young as, as four and five years of age, um, we, w within that, we try and teach them areas of character in the, such as, you know, empathy and, you know, having a positive outlook in the way that they speak to themselves. And whereas from a physical, we, we can speak about sport from a physical, technical, tactical point of view, but actually being able to, to teach them about positive character traits and, and how to build resilience within that. And also how people that they have made along that journey will have also have a, a big say in on, on how they turn out in terms of their mental and emotional well-being, you know, and the outlook look that they have on life. You know, so I would often talk about, you know, success. Success means so many different things to so many different people. You know, and so, to some people it may be, you know, in the business world, it's a big, big house and the big car. But to other people, it's a very simple life. And I think it's being being self-aware and being aware of what what best suits you as well. So I think the the work that we do with the train to be smart, it's still ongoing. There's plenty more to be done, but um, it, it actually teaching them about about you know positive positive character traits is hugely important and actually getting them to realize that something very simple like being supportive of a teammate is a, is a brilliant it is a brilliant character trait to have sure so let you look let's let's really get into kind of how that's done then because i mean that's that's the crux of it that again you know this isn't this isn't just a byproduct you know it, it quite often talking to um football coaches over the years and perhaps i even thought of this myself when early on in my career that your teamwork would naturally come because you're playing in a team it's not it's not necessarily the case but you've used the the term teaching it so that means that we're engaged in that process what what does that look like yeah i mean it, it, it it's quite a, it's quite a difficult one to, to quantify and i've said this before because um we, we have different styles of learning you know we have visual audio kinesthetic type of, of learning but the one thing i always say to our, our kids is you know a listening footballer and a, and a and an observing footballer is is a better footballer because they'll take more on board and, and it's like the old adage of you know what sir alex ferguson would say is that you know you two eyes and two ears but only one mic for a reason and we would we would talk about that you know we, we have the the slogan that it's smart to talk which is hugely important that you know the smart but then it's smart to talk the smart stands for sharing my anxieties relieves tension um so that that's a very important message to have but with that it's also important to, to use all the other senses within that so it's it's very it, it's very difficult to quantify because of the, the 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 various learning styles that you would have within that um but the one thing that we we have always set out was that this wasn't about producing the best professional footballers if that if that was to happen further down the line then great but that's not what it set out what what it set out to do is to produce better citizens that can be brought into their you know into their family life to be brought into their social life to be brought into their workplace because that's where productivity happens and it's almost as, as we talked about at the start and where it's it's almost uh, yes when we talk about the process it, it's it's not a process it, it's just almost moving towards something by the support network by your own family values by all of the belief systems so uh, that that's and that's why i say oh, there's still plenty of progress to be made you know with with what we do with the charity work and that's why we do outreach work within schools get that message out there you know so i, I would say it's more a i suppose a long-term slow burn <laughs> within it yeah yeah it's a longer learning process and and um interesting that you use learning styles so um you know learning styles is a, a contested space quite quite heavily in terms of you know whether yeah. whether it's a thing or not i think um i probably land on there being learning style preferences but that's not yes. necessarily that we should um support that preference you know sometimes it's actually mm -hmm. good to push 
uh, young people and indeed adults through a different learning style and that actually their learning might be even greater um, through through that. So, yeah, it's it's interesting. But that the the SEL space, you know, social emotional learning, which yeah. obviously is what you're working in, as well as the the, the sort of the mental yeah. health benefits. Um, there's an interesting distinction between um, a, a taught curriculum and a hidden curriculum. And I wanted to unpack this with you because I think this is where I land on on f- the use of football for this. That largely speaking, I think it's a hidden curriculum in so much as we sort of know what we're looking for. Like if we take um, uh, teamwork as, a, as an example that you said, you yeah. know, good, good teammates, you know, supporting team teammates, that's something we want to encourage and instill. But there's not necessarily a way of putting that into a prescribed curriculum. Does that make some sense or does that resonate with yeah, what you yeah, do? To- to- yeah, to- totally. And, um, you know, just going back to, to what you just said as well, is that the, the one thing I, I would often say is, you know, the best way to learn is through play. <laughs> so you, when you don't realize that you're actually working at something, you, you just you just go and do, and actually the, the young people I, I believe can sometimes help us as as um, I suppose adults as we get older. Were um, you know all of the I suppose all of the madness of, of what we talked about today, and of you know coming out of COVID and all of the things, all of those areas that we're chasing about after. You know, the young people a lot of the time just do, but they don't necessarily wonder why they're doing it. And if we could just unpack that, as you say, then you know, you, that that would be such a such a strong message, and, and I suppose such a, a strong learning tool, especially within sort of the whole mental health related toolkit. So that's yeah, to, totally totally understand what you're saying in terms of the, the you know the types of learning style. Um, I would go back to the best way to learn is through play. The unfortunate thing is that that's that's fine. But there still needs to be a certain amount of structure within play as well. And it's trying to, it's trying to I suppose, get that balance. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess I would describe that as, as us as space creators, which is something that I, I took from um, a chapter on skillful neglect uh, that I, I talk about probably way too often. But I love this term of, of space creator, that, that we as a coach, you know, we're we're literally creating the space that the players work in. So the parameters that they, they do that it's, it's a hard thing to do if we're looking at social and emotional learning within that, that it needs to be, the parameters need to be wide enough that those different things can emerge, but also narrow enough as that, as you say, there's a little bit of structure so we can sort of point towards certain outcomes, but that we're not necessarily uh, forcing those outcomes on the young people. That's right, and and, and it's such a it's such a, it, it's such a difficult dynamic because unless and and, and being in this sphere, I suppose, with from a from a clinical point of view, you view with the the physio end of things. Um, I've often said, you know, if, if if every single person, if every single young person, child, child had a, a personal development plan from day one, in which all of your GPs and your health professionals and your coaches and all had that space and a certain amount of input, then we would we would have the more of an opportunity to help so many more young people within it. So I've often said we had a personal development plan from the day that we were born and, and everybody contributed honestly, then you know we would be able to help and um, you know things like you know, social and economic deprivation and maybe, you know, abuses, whether they're physical or mental or emotional abuses that are going on that we don't know about, you know, that when we're trying that then there'd be probably, there'd be more of an opportunity for them to reach their own potential, you know, young for children and young people. So it's a very difficult space than that, but all we could do is, is do our best in any given moment. And that's, you know, from the area of mental health and well-being. With the diploma, that's that's what I have found is is not to take it, and I have all, always said this to be honest, you know, not to take it too personal. I got sent off in the baby <laughs> and give away a penalty for Manchester United. So, what? Yes, was I disappointed when I read 
the millions, you know, the, the papers and millions of papers being sold about that incident. Yes, but I took it as a learning experience, you know, and and not, I didn't hold on to it too much. Yes, I speak about it, but only as, I suppose, a resilience-based tool mm -hmm. as well. So I think, um, you know, being able to have a positive outlook about yourself, being able to impact on the on the children and young people and anybody that you come into contact with. I think as long as you're doing your best, I think in this space, you know, and you can look in the mirror and say that you tried, you tried your best to, to improve an outcome for them, then, you know, learning styles are relevant. Mm. Yeah, and that's that's such an important point to make for coaches that if, if we are trying to um, if we are trying to get coaches to see themselves as able to impact this realm of what football can help to develop, because obviously they have other uh, outcomes that they're trying to uh, achieve at the same time, depending on their domain and age stage, they're obviously going to be looking at technical, tactical outcomes, physical outcomes, as you've spoken. So you know, we, we recognize that there's a lot going on. It's a chaotic space. But if we're trying to get coaches to have a greater awareness of social emotional stuff, well, the, the first part is that they need to role model that they and, yes. and recognize themselves as a role model. And that that shouldn't be a pressure either that, as you're saying, understanding that we can show humility, some vulnerability in front of young people to say, I've done my best in this situation. It might not have been yeah. the best in terms of what whatever we describe as a positive outcome, but in this moment, you know, I, I've done my absolute best here. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily yeah. a bad thing to to say or to show. No, no, I think I think it's a very important part of it, and, and I think having been involved, you know, the, the, within football at a at quite a high level. Um, you, what you tend to find is, and I know you're laughing and saying quite a high level. Well, I was going to yeah, say it. Yeah, national no. football. <laughs> 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 but but I, I think, and, and this is this is I suppose an interesting one. You know, from from the very until the very last day where I, you know, put the put the, the nail hammer the nail in and put the, the boots up for a little while. Obviously, I'm back playing a little bit of the over 45s now, so I can take them down for a bit. But since I did that with the professional and, and semi-professional game, up until that point, I always seen it as I was still continuing to improve my game. You know, I never seen myself as a leap. Never, you know, never put myself on that pedestal. Now, there are ones that, that can do that and say that they, you know, would title themselves like that's entirely up to themselves um but the the one thing is that if you can e even in terms of confidence you know you you can have a run of games when you're playing at the top level and you can you, you can be playing at the top end of your game and then you can run maybe for three or four games then and all of a sudden you know your confidence goes and even even the best players and i remember Roy Keane came over as part of the the charity the charity Q and A in two thousand and sixteen, and Roy said, you know, he had moments of self. -right. That's a player, you know, who's renowned worldwide, and he had moments of self. -right. All the best players will say, you know, that when whenever they were going through a bad run, but but they were able to to face failure and get on with it. It wasn't to say that they didn't have um or sorry, the face fear. Um, you know, they, they were able to face fear. And, you know, it doesn't wasn't to say that they weren't scared at times or felt maybe more nervous than, than other times, but they got on with it and realized that over time if they continued to 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 work hard at their game that they would they would get past that side of things. So there's as I said, there's so many so many dynamics to it yeah how how do you i mean because as much as you've described yourself in that way and that there's you know maybe a, a different level again above um in terms of what you've achieved professionally you know how how do you impart some of those experiences that you've had 
at what I would certainly consider the top level of the game to the young people that you work with? You know what? It's it, it's very difficult. I've been working in this area uh, with the diploma, and, and whether it's you know from from a very young age, the the amount of concentration that you have as a young person, right up in adulthood, even as adults, we look at sort of 15, 20 minutes tops. And and those people that I suppose are good listeners or good learners, you know, in whatever style, I don't know, we're, we're, we're even not able, we're not quantified in that sphere. What, what I would say is, you know, the ones that are able to concentrate and hold that concentration and then learn from it through the practical base as well, um, is is hugely important, and I I just think um, we the the part of that knowledge I think you know the, the the best coaches that I have had you know weren't necessarily at the top age groups. Tim, I have to say you know uh, the, we have a, we had a coach who who brought I think six six full internationals from this area in Lurgan for Gavin. Um, for 25,000 kids. They, I think he had six, there were six full internationals playing in 1986 from this area, which was never known. And, and they were all a, around the same age as well. We were all Neil Lennon, Jerry Taggart, and Keith Rowland, myself, Jerry McMahon, Jared Flynn, the same age group as myself. Um, I, I know Michael O'Neill was from around this area, but I, I, I know there was six anyway that we counted. And Dazzy McGinnis Spunker used to say, like, when the kids got to 15, he, he says they were always too old, or they're almost too old for him. He didn't go beyond 15, he says, because Dazzy was about five foot three, or five foot four. And he says, once it started to look down at me, he said, that was the time for me to go. So, you know, and, but you see that, that coach and coaches like him. You know, they're the ones that that give the first bit of encouragement. And it wouldn't have mattered whether it was a player like myself who would have been maybe one of the better players within the group and, and captained the team, you know, or whether it was somebody that was only getting 15 or 20 minutes here or there. And he made them feel 100 foot tall. And in those early stages, that's that's the big one. You know, it's 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 giving them a passion for you know the game and giving them a passion for whatever it is. Mm. So I think again, going back to your, your your question surrounding like how do you how do you get give maximum in, impact through those you know that you're coaching? Um, I think it's encouraging to enjoy it, encourage the the passion to come out both inwardly and outwardly. They they make them self aware of what their strengths are. You know, and also the, the the work on maybe things that they, they they need to do. You know that maybe they're not just as strong with. You know, uh, and and I, I I'm, I'm in a privileged position, really privileged position, because I was at Manchester United from ninety two to ninety seven. You know, I, you know I know we weren't going to talk too much about the whole, you know, the players because it wasn't about that. But I was in a privileged position because. I, even even if I was only best mascot during that time, hmm. I was able to take character traits off, you know, the right and the Paul Scott uh, and, and and listen to and learn from and watch on a training field and watch in a practice game and play within the reserves for, you know. So those were all things that if you're a learner, then you know. You can you can be have a black and white way of thinking, which is like, oh well, I don't want to learn, or you can just be a continual grower, you know, in terms of goals, reality, opportunity, way forward, and never see yourself as the, the finished article. So, uh, the, the the dynamics surrounding coaching, I've been privileged in in the the coaches that I've worked with, and they have just helped contribute to where I am now, I suppose. Yeah, and there's 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 plenty to unpack there. I mean, it, it you you've described perhaps as coaches supporting uh, young players fall in love with the game. I think sometimes that's called like a first fascination with the game. Um, you you've spoken about how to how you as a player have 
treated yourself as a lifelong learner and and this is you know as coaches we need to be slightly aware that you know we're just part of the the process we're, we're not central to it we, there's definitely responsibility but being aware that we're part of a, a much com- more complex system that players are going to be learning off them themselves off each other off their family off uh, their school teachers schoolmates that we're just part of a wider environment that these players are involved in. And, um, you know, that's both a blessing and a bit of a curse, I think, you know, if, if you think about it too hard. Um, but yeah, uh-huh. but what, something that, that's always stuck with me a long time, and I don't know whether I'm getting this quote right, and I can't even tell you who it's from either, but, you know, players don't really care so much about what you know until they know that you care. And and I think that was kind of yeah. what you were touching on a little bit there that, you know, some of your coaches in your time, it wasn't necessarily the, the older age groups. It was some of those younger ones. And I would guess that it's because they had a connection with you. Yeah. And, and I suppose that and that doubles up the area of, of mental health and well-being, because, you know, a lot of what we speak about is that, um, you don't necessarily, you know, I'm not a, a, a clinical psychologist or a psychiatrist. You know, I am very practically based in terms of my, the, the, way, the, the style that I use and, and I suppose the experiences that I've had as well, Tim, which I suppose you can always go back to when you're speaking to the young people, whether it's in a, you know, a footballing environment or mental health environment. But the, the big ones that we speak about within it is, you know, that you don't necessarily need to be an expert, but you do need to cure. And, and young people and the people you're connected with need to know that you cure and also that you don't judge in what goes on. Because I think, you know, whenever there's a judgment, they, they have to appreciate that judgment and feel feel comfortable with you judging. And that's, that's, a, that's a big one because really... You know, young people um, initially just want to, to know that you're interested in them and that you're trying to get the best out of them. And then as it moves on, whether that's, as I say, within football coaching or whether that's within mental health and well-being coaching, then, of course, you can impact those experiences, that bit of knowledge, that knowledge base uh, to them so that, you know, when you're in a trusted space, I suppose. Yeah. Fantastic. And, uh, but, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about how sort of ideologically this happens. Um, could, could you start to give us some uh, even examples, if you can, about literally how this happens? You know, what, what, what is the action of the coach in these kinds of moments as they, as they appear in training? It, you know, again, just going back, we talked about you know the personal development plan, and and I footballers, especially as as they, they go up the levels, don't get me wrong, they've all different you know values, the different belief systems, uh, you know, the, the, there's players from all different walks of life. I, I I can understand that, but the one thing about footballers as you step up the level is they they have to make decisions very quickly on a pitch. So, for example, you can. You know, you can try and play offside against York City and make the wrong decision, and then have to chase back, and give away a penalty, get a, get sent off. <laughs> that happens in a, in a in a split moment, you know, because the quicker up or the, the higher up the levels you go. Um, but as part of that process, that you know, we have to make decisions quickly, and because of that, you will judge, take your you will you will trust your instinct and go that little bit. Quicker, I suppose, make a judgment call within it, and uh, that's that's a very that's a very interesting one of the solos way. You know, some players that uh, were top top range players, you know, don't necessarily make it within management because you know they they were so mentally focused on themselves, but maybe struggled to see the dynamics of other you know, other players or other young people if they go into younger, you know, young people coaching, but also the dynamics of even a family environment. So I have seen all of those rounds, Tim, and I, it's, 
we we had a facility and, and still have a facility where you know if if young people if there's games and and maybe something has gone on in which the dynamic between host parent young person or child you know they, they want to speak about it we've got a safe space which is a few days after a game now you'll find that w- within this there's so many dynamics that it could just be an off day and they don't want the, the, the no real interest in it but i see it a lot of the time working with this that there are sometimes bigger issues further down the line and that's that's important to recognize within this you know that that that, that side of things is is very very difficult to quantify unless people speak up about it and the honest truth is there and that's why the whole it's smart to talk message is there i never spoke about you know my own brothers um passing through suicide until 2013 and, the, and it was 1993 when he first passed away you know and that wasn't and and funny enough that that wasn't through you know uh, whereas it was a stigma term, you know, years back for things like self harm, suicide, and that was nothing to do with it. I was just never asked about it because it was very personal, both to the family and also to the club. At the time, they were very good at that stage, but that's the way it was. So it's amazing unless you have all the the facts and dynamics surrounding it, you're you know you're not going to be totally of benefit. But just going very quickly back to the start you know the question that you asked i'll give you an example the the team that i took from under 12 i i started one of the first teams the pbs 2013 we took them from under 12 and we were we were very average at the, at the time and you know the, the first few games we lost and lost heavily but after about four or five games and the, the structure and the, the start to get a sense of belief and I suppose knowing that the, 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 the manager he actually played a bit of the game <laughs> but wouldn't maybe help um, but over time we developed a really really good side and you know one of one of the lads in particular um, the, the one thing about him that I noticed from the very start was that he was a, he was a great listener said very little Led by example, you know, just just did the right things at the right time, and and but it's amazing. He he was a he he was um his family were you know, are Manchester United fanatics, <laughs> and you know and he went on and he just recently he he he's now playing in the Irish league and involved with the, the Irish league side, and he he played within the first team there at eighteen quite recently and. He got man of the match within that game, and he left us a, a couple of years back. And I always said, you know, they'll eventually get to whatever level it is. All we can do is support them and and give them the best, I suppose. And uh, I wouldn't say it for just just create the best environment for them, him. You know, whether that's people, places, and and I think that what what I noticed about him was that he. He took on board actively every word that you said, and then he practically, you know, got on the the trying to carry it out. So I suppose that was that's a, a success story within it. But I I don't see you know from their ability and and where they've reached within football. I don't necessarily see that as just being the success. I see all of the young people that come to me, and and I I still meet them in the street. And they they are good human beings who who actually want to have a conversation and talk about all the memories that they had, just as important, you know. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a an idea. Yeah, it it does, and it it speaks to you know the way in which you you set up the the culture, the environment, and you know, my own experiences of trying to do things that way. I very often found the same as what you're describing that early on you you could do get get pumped in games. It does seem to be like a a characteristic of uh coaching in this way is that because you're uh offering up some of the autonomy to the players and you're you're uh, at least co-constructing what you're doing rather than it being led by by the coach 
that quite often, you know, players, especially if they haven't experienced that, that early on, that's very difficult for them because they're so used to having some form of direction given to them, essentially. Um, so those early stages are, are obviously very difficult for them. But the the skill here is for us, I think, just being consistent and, and being persistent in the messages that we're, we're, we're giving and to our own sort of philosophy there of, of I'm not going to take over this process of the players getting as much out of competing and, and uh, enjoying this sport as they possibly can. You, you're, you're echoing some of the conversation that I had with um, Alfie Bernson recently, who was the, the coach of uh, Erling Haaland. And, and the, the mantra that they have there of as many as possible for as long as possible. And, and he spoke really warmly, just as you have, of you know, all of the players. The, the, the point was to take as much care over the, the holistic development of everyone. And the fact that a few pros have come out of that process is, is just a lovely bonus. Yeah, yeah, I don't, to- totally agree. And, and you know, even uh, I always remember, I think the first game we ever played, we were, we were beaten 9-1. And every time that and, and we were playing, it, first of all, we were playing in goals in which uh, 11 aside goals in which the nets were far too big for the kids. Anyway, so every time that the ball was chipped over our goalkeeper, it was going. In. Oh, <laughs> but um, after every goal went in, I just said, let's go again. And that, that it was a simple phrase and it was just, OK, let's go again. And what it was making them do, and it was very simple was to say, look, let's not hold on to this. I'm not you know, judging you by it. You know, so I think even the, the language that we could use, that the language that we use, the way in which it's put across, all ultimately will will affect um, you know, children and young people both negatively and positively, depending on what way you, you put that through. So um, um, there, there it is. There's that brilliant example of, you know, using your experience to um, inform how you are as a coach and what you're doing with this, this charity and, and with the, the players that you work with. So I think that's an excellent place to, to, to finish there. You know, as per usual with many of my guests, we could have a conversation for many more hours and maybe we'll just leave it open to, to have you come back in, in uh, some time in the future to, to tell us how it's all going. Um, I do, do have uh, a final question, as always. Uh, it's if you could have an audience with just one person, who would you choose? Cool. And, and is, this, is this past or... or I, I, let's, this, let's say in this example, I've got full power. Right? We, can, we can do whatever we like. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, it, it's a, it's amazing because I've I've met quite a few you know footballers that played at the very top end and and really nice fellas um but I never got particularly overawed by them but you know I've seen a, a fella and I suppose it's my values uh, as well I mean I I grew up in, in Northern Ireland and there's a there's a lot of dynamics involved in Northern Ireland in regards to politics religion all of the above which I. I'm not, I don't have a major interest in, but obviously, you know, because of where we're from. But um, there's a fella, uh, I went up to watch the game. I was actually the assistant coach at Man United. And I remember there was a fella standing beside, and I walked past him, and I know that face from somewhere. And there's a fella called John Hume. Now, John Hume was part of the, the peace process. And within Northern Ireland is an absolute, you know, giant of a man, but yet so quiet. And he was somebody that I was actually quite uh, overawed to go and speak to. You know, uh, just seeing him, it was like, that's John Hume. And so I would love to have a conversation, very intelligent man, and did so much, you know, the, the, to bring Northern Ireland forward. Um, so I would say probably, probably John Hume. Love it. What a great answer. And I'm going to have to go away and find out more about him now. Um, Pat, look, what's the best way for anyone to get in touch with you if they want 
Yeah, well, we, we have our, our Facebook page, Train to Be Smart Juniors. We also have our, our website, www.traintobesmart.com. You know, um, and we're also on Twitter as, as Train to Be Smart Juniors as well. So we have the, the various social media sites as you have to be, because you have to be fairly current. But um, yeah, so you can reach out and also uh, at a personal level, obviously, um, um, on social media as well. I, do, I see it as a platform. If it's used for good, then um, yeah, it's like anything to get the message out there. That's right. It can be so positive, can't it? So, I, you yeah. know, look, I'll make sure that all of those are, are tagged and in the details so that, you know, those that do want to know more can find that detail and reach out to you. It just leaves me to say, welcome to the tribe. <laughs> Brilliant, Tim. I have to say, I, I, I do, you know, I do podcasts, I do interviews and that, but this was something that I really, really enjoyed because it was more than just, you know, the football side of things, um, especially that whole dynamic. Because the truth of the matter is we're all just trying to, to bring, well, you know, anybody that, that wants to, to, to be a really successful coach needs to, to understand all the dynamics that go into the playing sport. I know what a, what a great medium it is to, to teach young, you know, kids and young people. Well, that, that means a lot. And, and thank you for giving us all of your uh, insight and experience today. Okay, thank you. That's it for episode three of season three. What a humble conversation with Pat and an interesting insight into what life after football has meant for him and how he's using football to bring such positive development to the young people his organisation works with. Do go check out their website and get hold of Pat on social media if you're looking to find out more. We touched on some topics relating to social and emotional learning today and that's what our August topic is going to be over at the Developer Tribe online network. We'll be looking at theory and practical examples of how this important aspect of youth development might work in sport coaching settings. Each month we'll be covering a different topic so come join us over at thedevelopertribe.mn.co to journey freely and loyally towards effective coaching practice with the tribe. And don't forget to subscribe to the pod which goes out every Thursday. Thanks for being here and we'll see you again soon.